Good morning from the sunny Copenhagen. Welcome to the webinar, Cooling Your Home, How to Connect Residential Buildings to District Cooling, hosted by Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. My name is Aris. I'm working as a program officer at the Copenhagen Center, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. A couple of things before we move to the main content of our webinar. This webinar is going to be about 90 minutes long, including time for the Q&A session at the end. In case you cannot stay until the end or want to get back to our presentations, all the materials and uh, the recording of the whole webinar will be available online in a few days on the Copenhagen Center Knowledge Management System. And we have many other webinars and information there. Have a look, I'll give uh, more information in a few minutes. A few things about the Copenhagen Center. The center conducts research and advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency and serves as energy efficiency hub for the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. The center has an established network of, for global, regional and national partners with a broad range of stakeholders to help accelerate, accelerate the implementation of energy efficiency activities. A few things, uh, are, uh, on a regular basis, the Copenhagen Center is uh, conducting webinars. All materials, including recordings and presentations from previous webinars, can be found on Copenhagen's Knowledge Management System. Click, uh, click the e-learning sections, as you can see here. The material of today's webinar will be uploaded shortly. Now, I would like to briefly introduce the speaker of today's webinar. Uh, Bacules uh, is a business development manager at Tabrit. Vikram is the national president of the Indian Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers. Joao is the CEO of uh, Clima Espaco in Lisbon. Jolun is a senior advisor at Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. Rosmi is uh, an assistant professor at National Institute, Institute of Technology, uh, Rurkela in India. Finally, I would like to inform that you can send us your questions during the presentations and we will do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. Please do not forget to mention the name of the panelists that the question is for. And with that, I would like to give the floor to Benjamin. Hello, everybody, and uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'm Benjamin Hickman. I work for United Nations Environment Programme on a program promoting district heating and district cooling globally called the District Energy and Cities Initiative, of which the Copenhagen Center is one of our many partners. Um, this webinar is part of a series of webinars with, we're organizing, which is aimed at promoting district cooling and understanding how to accelerate it, particularly in developing countries where obviously the United Nations is, is very focused. Uh, so this is the second one. You can find the previous one on uh, our YouTube channel. And uh, as Aris said, the others will be available online as well. Upcoming, we'd have ones about real estate developers, about how renewables and waste heat can be connected to district cooling, how district cooling can help phase down uh, HFC refrigerants and help countries meet the Kigali Amendment, how to plan and procure district cooling projects, and what cities and local governments can do to accelerate them. Uh, so just about the initiative, these are the countries we're currently working in globally um, and we help countries both to develop district cooling projects or heating projects, develop the policy framework that can support these and to build awareness in, in the industry with policymakers and with citizens about the benefits of district heating and district cooling. Um, so if you'd like to find more about, out more about the initiative, please contact us and we'd be happy to uh, give you a brief and partners from across industry uh, cities are welcome to join the initiative and, and benefit from the learnings. So space cooling uh, has witnessed historically a very fast growth um, around the world. And you can see from this chart, which is from the IEA, that from 1990 up until around 2016, we've at least uh, tripled the amount of cooling demand. And something which is uh, the cooling capacity and something which is important to show is that half of this is for residential capacity and half of this is for commercial capacity. And this is a trend which has mostly been focused in developing uh, developed countries. Uh, 
So you can see, for example, the United States, Korea, some of these countries have got very high shares of cooling demand, and it's starting to have huge impacts. So in the United States, the proportion that's from um, peak, the proportion of peak load where cooling is contributing to peak load is over 25%. So this has huge impacts on the uh, power grid, and it has huge impacts, of course, on greenhouse gas emissions, as well as um, can actually lead to blackouts, etc. So tackling cooling is a major priority, uh, both environmentally and for our economies. Um, but what's even more alarming is when you actually look at how this growth is going to uh, carry on to 2050. And what we see is actually that the residential uh, cooling is going to grow a lot faster than the commercial cooling. Uh, so that by 2050, we have a much larger share for uh, the residential sector. Um, and so tackling any programs that are aiming to uh, improve the sustainability of cooling, we really need to focus on the residential sector. Um, and this is sort of one of the purposes of today's webinar, is looking at how we can actually bring on uh, district cooling to tackle this huge growth we're going to see. So yes, yeah, 70% of the increase in energy use for space cooling is going to come from the residential sector. So it's really important. And the actual transition is going to be a huge increases within the global south for space cooling. Um, whereas historically cooling has maybe been a luxury good uh, in developed countries, uh, what we're seeing now is that developing countries and uh, countries which have uh, got middle middle classes growing rapidly are going to have huge increases in the amount of space cooling. So by 2050, we'll see the case where India will be the largest consumer of cooling in the world, up from around 8% of, of households today. And this rapid, rapid growth has huge impl implications for their, their economy, but also for the environment. Same in countries such as Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, you can see these huge growths just in the, just in 35 years. And so this is this is why the UN is focused on uh, supporting these countries to realize sustainable cooling. So in India, where I'm based and we're working on district cooling programs here, uh, the government has released uh, a national cooling action plan. It's one of the first countries to do it. And the scale of growth in the residential uh, residential sector is sort of mind-boggling uh, from low levels today you can see it's actually increasing up to 11 times just in the next 20 years so this is a huge increase in the amount of uh, power generation that would be required and so we're looking at how we can actually tackle this with more sustainable methods uh, so just in 20 years they'll grow from eight percent of households having an ac to 40 percent and some of this will be households getting an AC for the first time. Some of it will be households getting a second AC, getting a third AC. And what we need to do is look at programs that obviously are impacting the uh, high income groups, which have maybe got multiple ACs and helping them to do more sustainable cooling. We also need to look at the, the sort of middle income groups, ones getting the first AC. As we know that they will get an AC, how can we uh, preempt preempt that and actually support them to develop that in a more sustainable way before this real estate is built with sort of locked in ACs which are highly inefficient. Uh, so one obviously one technology we're promoting is district cooling and for anyone who doesn't know what district cooling is it's essentially uh, centralizing uh, cooling within a neighborhood so rather than each building having its own ACs or its own chillers, we centralize that into one plant and we provide the cooling or chilled water through underground pipes to each building where heat exchanges with the building's centralized system extract the chilled water. Um, and these are some of what you might see. So a plant room, this is where we have our chillers in the, in the central plant. A control center where we optimize the network and make sure we're providing the right amount of chilled water for the right temperatures. The underground pipe network, which is highly insulated to prevent losses. And you have a return pipe and a supplied pipe and a substation like this, which you might find underneath a building or next to a building, which links the supply pipe from the district cooling plant with the building's internal cooling system. Um, so 
the purpose of the webinar and the reason why we just we picked this topic is that actually district cooling has developed historically uh, in more developed countries we can say uh, we see huge amounts of district cooling in the middle east uh, particularly in the united arab emirates um, and some of the other gulf countries uh, in the nordic countries the usa uh, we have district cooling systems in Italy, in, in France as well, uh, growing district cooling uh, industry in China and significant district cooling in Japan and Korea. Uh, so it's definitely something that grew out in the developed countries a lot faster. And that's because in these countries, I have a, uh, cooling is a definite necessity, uh, particularly say in the UAE, where I don't think I'd like to live without air conditioning or we're able to meet uh, such a luxury um, where consumers are maybe willing to pay a slightly higher price to have higher levels of thermal comfort with air filtration in their house, et cetera. So residential sector district cooling um, has been developed in those countries. But this isn't true for district heating and district heating developed um, in, in many countries worldwide, irrespective actually of um, income. So countries like China, Mongolia, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, Russia, all of these developed huge amounts of district heating. And that's because heating was is not seen as a luxury good. It's not something that you can really do without. But what we're seeing now with the growth of cooling demand, which I showed in countries like India, Indonesia, uh, Mexico, is that cooling no longer is a uh, luxury in some of these countries. Living in Delhi as I do, I wouldn't like to live here without AC and getting the first AC is a huge aspiration for many people and the cooling demand growth is inevitable. Uh, in China they increased the amount of um, ACs from a very low number uh, around 10% up to 100% over just 10 years just because as soon as people can afford it they went for it because it's such a necessity in some cities. So that's to say it's 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 becoming a necessity, especially with climate change and heat waves, and it's, inev and it's becoming inevitable. So we need to shift the logic from looking at maybe district cooling as a luxury good providing to residential, but as more of a uh, something which is a public service that cities and governments should be looking to provide, especially because they know most new developments over the next 20 years will have ACs. So this is a sort of challenge uh, to the industry. Um, and actually, if we want to expand district cooling into these sort of residential buildings, we're going to need uh, public in intervention um, with supportive, for example, tax policies, supportive power prices, uh, mandated development. And to get these kind of policies, we have to show that district cooling is, is can benefit a larger proportion of society and it's not just for shopping malls and for ultra ultra rich people it can actually impact middle class people as well so the challenge really is how can we supply district cooling to these buildings and how can we simplify the technology so that it's not as expensive and what are the benefits of doing this within the neighborhood and what are the actual barriers as well um, so with that i'd like to open it up to our expert panel uh, who i look forward to hearing their different opinions and as Aris said, please pose any questions that you have and we'll get them answered at the end. So thank you very much. Hello, good morning. Um, I am Juan Castaneda, CEO of uh, Clima Espaço, uh, the company in charge of uh, uh, building and operating the Lisbon district heating and cooling system. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, share with you uh, our experience in uh, connecting residential buildings and managing the B2C market in uh, the Lisbon DHC. Uh, it's in fact, uh, the system that we have in Lisbon, it's uh, an integrated system, integrating heating and cooling, uh, which is the right solution for a climate like uh, the one we have in Lisbon. Uh, even if uh, uh, I have to say that uh, two thirds of our uh, energy supply is cooling and just one third is heating, even so heating is still, uh, is still relevant uh, here in Lisbon. Um, uh, one of the topics that I will highlight during my presentation uh, is something that it's not uh, yet uh, uh, so usual, uh, which is uh, um, the fact that we have individual metering and individual contracting 
uh, flat by flat uh, in the residential market. Uh, because it was uh, uh, a requirement since the beginning of the of the system, uh, and because due to our culture uh, it it wouldn't work uh, otherwise, and uh, um, because it's the best it's the best solution for uh, in terms of rational use of energy. And if we look at the directives, uh, at least in Europe, that will be the future for uh, uh, DHC in the residential market. Um, well, just uh, to start uh, with, a, with a short and brief presentation about the system that we have in Lisbon. So uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it was built in a, in a new area uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, we organized in Lisbon a, a world exhibition called Expo 98. And there was a, an old area with old industries that was fully renovated uh, uh, for the exhibition and prepared for the future. Um, it has a fantastic location in the best part of the city, so it's now the heart of the modern city of Lisbon. And today, uh, about 20,000 people live there, and about 20,000 people work in this area. And some of the most important attractions of the city are within this uh, new uh, area, which is called, in English, uh, Nations Park. Uh, so uh, it is a new urban area, so buildings are uh, designed and built to be connected to the DHC system. So a part of our work starts uh, much uh, before uh, the construction uh, in terms of preparing the building and uh, dealing with, uh, with the project teams and dealing with the uh, real estate promoters uh, to uh, uh, prepare their buildings to be connected to the, um, to the system. That's a very important part in order to avoid uh, uh, mistakes and problems uh, uh, in the future. Um, so this is not the most important part, but just, it's just an, a brief overview. So we uh, run, we operate a, a, a high efficiency tri-generation plant, uh, producing heating, cooling and electricity. And we have for the moment 90 kilometers of pipes uh, in the area, uh, a big part of it in technical galleries. And we have uh, for the moment 140 uh, substations, uh, which means that we are supplying uh, about 140 buildings or groups of buildings at the moment, but these figures are uh, obviously growing uh, year by year. Um, regarding the market, uh, I have to say that still for the moment, uh, uh, large B2B customers account for uh, about 90% of our energy sales, uh, which includes a lot of different buildings, offices, hotels, uh, uh, equipment buildings, very different uh, buildings, sports facilities, a lot of different things. Um, but uh, um, um, the fact is that we have uh, uh, also a, an interesting B2C market, residential market. Uh, still for the moment, it accounts only for 10% of our energy sales, but we expect it to grow in the future. And it represents uh, about 90% of our uh, customers in terms of number of customers. So you can see uh, uh, by these pictures that we are talking about uh, big uh, 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 residential buildings with the hundreds of apartments inside. Um, and uh, um, uh, we'll see how to, how to take care of this uh, very specific market. Um, there are in fact specific needs to handle uh, uh, this B2C market. Uh, so, um, on one hand, uh, we have to know that uh, as we have uh, individual metering, uh, we need to have individual contracting and invoicing for each, uh, uh, for each client. So, therefore, we need to manage uh, thousands of small customers. So, normally, uh, uh, the residential market in, B2C, in, in, in DHC uh, uh, is uh, treated, uh, um, well, the customer is the condominium. Is, a, is the building, the, each building is, 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 a, is a, a client. Here, uh, as I explained before, it's not the case. So we have individual clients, individual contracts, flat by flat. So we need to, to develop specific tools and offers in order to tackle uh, um, the needs of this uh, specific market. At the moment, we have about uh, 3,500 B2C customers, uh, 5,000 little meters, so some of them are have heating and cooling, but some of them have only heating or only cooling. It's a decision made by each final client 
depending on what uh, each family uh, think they need. Um, regarding this point of individual metering, um, uh, well, we, we have done it since the beginning of our project in Lisbon. So we, we, we have now 20 years of experience in managing this type of uh, system. Uh, but uh, when we look at uh, European directives, uh, especially energy efficiency directive, we see that uh, um, it will be the future. So uh, I would say more and more uh, the requirement for having individual uh, metering uh, flat by flat it's 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 a growing uh, requirement for, for for this type of system so it's something that we need to handle and uh, um we uh, over the, the recent years we are we have uh, uh, shared a lot of our experience with uh, some colleagues uh, from all over the world that uh, want to understand how we do it uh, because it's really something uh, specific um so the first point is that uh, when we have uh, a residential market with thousands of customers uh, instead of having just a few hundreds uh, of uh, big customers we have thousands of small customers uh, you need to uh, prepare your organiza organization to uh, uh, reply to this uh, to this uh, to this market for example in lisbon uh, we have a small store uh, which is also a contact center where people come and make their uh, uh, contracts and receive their information. And uh, well, our experience shows us that uh, we, we cannot pretend that we, we will handle all this uh, online by internet. So we, we need to have a physical, uh, a physical organization to receive people, to explain people how this works and to make uh, their contracts. Uh, we have uh, then a customer support service in, in charge of managing the contacts, uh, requests, and even claims from uh, all this market. Uh, and also a small operational team dedicated to install, remove, and maintain meters. So, well, uh, summarizing a bit, so you need to have to have a, a small team. Uh, it's not a big team. It's a, a team because it's a small market uh, yet. Uh, just in a, in, a, in, a, in a part of the city. Um, so we, we need to have a small team uh, uh, dedicated to manage this uh, residential market. Uh, another point which, which is very important is when you start supplying the residential customers and uh, well, your, your counterpart is not, uh, is not a, a company or uh, even a condominium, it's a family, a huge family. You need to know that uh, uh, um, uh, you need to provide uh, uh, an additional service uh, to people, which is to maintain uh, the system inside the buildings. You know, so you uh, normally the DHC uh, provider uh, um, supplies energy to the substation, normally in the basement of the building, and normally that is the border, that is the limit of the service of a DHC provider. But when you start contracting the service with uh, uh, residential customers. Uh, you need to know that your energy needs to arrive to each flat and people uh, uh, need to be able to use it. Uh, uh, and uh, it's not enough to say uh, if there is one day a problem inside the building uh, because the pumps doesn't work or because there is something uh, inside the flat which is not working. It's not enough just to say that, uh, well, it's not the fault of the energy provider. It's something inside the building. No, you have to uh, provide people uh, with a solution for uh, those problems, because finally what people need to have is uh, the system working, is the air conditioning working. So we have developed, and it was not something that we, we were prepared in the beginning, uh, because it was new for us uh, in the beginning of the project. Uh, but finally, uh, after, after a couple of years, we decided to develop uh, uh, an additional, a complementary service, which is, uh, we, we call it home. It's uh, uh, just dedicated to, uh, um, to the, this residential market where we provide maintenance services to people. And so when a customer calls us uh, at three o'clock in the morning saying that uh, I want to, to, to have a shower and I don't have hot water or my air conditioning is not working, we have a solution for him. Uh, that, uh, that's a very important part when you develop a, a, a residential market to have a solution for uh, um, for this uh, for this type of things uh, another topic regarding the um, the i mean the tools to to manage this uh, residential market 
is we have to know that we of course that's obvious we need to have uh, uh, um, an, an uh, ERP uh, software uh, which is able to uh, manage all the system which includes a lot of things which are not common in the in, in other systems uh, you have uh, thousands of apartments uh, you have the to have the information about the power the meters everything the readings so you have to develop uh, an ERP and, uh, and uh, the whole software uh, to manage uh, this system. So we have done it uh, in our case uh, some years ago. Uh, we started with a with a with a in-house software, but then we, it was not enough because the market was growing. And now, now we have a, a professional tool developed to specifically for this market. So that's something that's something that we need to have in mind when you try to address this resident, residential market and you try to contract. Uh, the service which each of the final users. Um, another point uh, which is very important, but of course we all know this, is the uh, the invoice. Uh, so when you have uh, 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 on the, uh, in front of you a B two B a B two B professional client, it's easier to speak about all these uh, technical things because. Uh, they have, the client has experts to, to, to speak with us and to understand what we are saying, what we are speaking about. Here we are talking about normal people who are not used to, 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 to these technical things and who, who doesn't uh, understand too much about uh, this with eating and cooling. So you need to understand that, uh, for example, your invoice needs to be absolutely uh, clear, easy to read, and uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, put a focus on energy efficiency. Uh, so that was uh, something that we tried to improve over the years here, to improve the, uh, um, the layout of the invoice in order to make it as clear uh, uh, or clear enough for people, for normal citizens to understand it and to, uh, um, and to, 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 to understand it better, I would say. Um, there is another point which we, which we always uh, uh, mention when we when we speak about this topic of a residential market with individual metering, is a point the point of energy losses. It's something that uh, uh, you need to um, when you, you are designing a new system and if you want to address uh, final users uh, uh, with individual contracts and metering, uh, you need to know that. Uh, um, Always, even when the buildings are properly designed and built and maintained, even so, there are always losses. Uh, in this case, because we are talking about cooling, cooling losses inside the buildings, uh, because you have one meter at the entrance of the building, and then you have uh, well, a large number of meterings at the entrance of each flat, and. Uh, 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 be between those meters, the, the one at the entrance and the other ones, you will have losses, and you you need to know how to how, how will you take care uh, uh, of those losses. So who is going to pay, and how are you going to charge for these losses? So there there is no perfect solution for that, but you need to think about that and to 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 try to uh, to, to to find the best solution to handle uh, uh, this uh, topic in your specific district uh, heating and cooling system. Okay, it's an important subject, I have to say. And finally, uh, just to finalize uh, my presentation, um, uh, just to tell you that we are, well, it, this is, uh, of course, a, a never ending uh, process of improvement, uh, uh, of course, in terms of efficiency, uh, uh, technically speaking, uh, on the production and distribution side, but also uh, uh, in other topics. So uh, I, I, I'm just mentioning two points that we are working on at the moment and which are uh, very important. On one hand, um, we have to know that this system here that I'm presenting you uh, uh, was built uh, 20 years ago. So it's already a long time ago. And uh, when uh, it was built, uh, all these things that we speak about now, like big data, like digitalization and all that, were not uh, uh, an issue 20 years ago. Uh, so now uh, uh, we are uh, um, starting to install a, a telemetering system, um, <clears throat> meaning that uh, and up to now, um, uh, all these meters are manually read, uh, read uh, uh, which is not the best uh, uh, solution. So we are uh, developing a telemetering system 
that's not yet uh, in operation, but will be in the coming uh, in the coming uh, year or years, I would say. <coughs> and uh, um, um, we are also uh, uh, working on another thing, uh, which is very important. So for the moment, uh, uh, our contact, uh, our normal contact with the residential customers is to send them every two months, because uh, we do it every two months, an invoice. And uh, of course, that's not the, 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 the most appropriate uh, way to have a, 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 a good uh, customer experience. So what we are trying to do now, what we are developing now, is, to, uh, 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 is, a, is a tool uh, with, uh, which we can uh, uh, share all the data uh, that we are collecting uh, through the metering system uh, share it with the final uh, customer so that they can have in their uh, mobile phone, in their iPad, uh, uh, they can have uh, information about their consumption, they can compare their consumption uh, this month with the consumption of the similar month last year, they, 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 they can have a way to see if the consumption is going well, if something needs to be uh, adjusted or not. And we think that uh, this is something that is going to uh, improve very much the customer experience. So that's something that we are working on at the moment. It's not yet working, but we expect to have it uh, soon. And uh, of course, if we uh, design a new uh, district eating and cooling uh, system for the residential market now, of course, that's a, a basic requirement to do it uh, like that. And uh, so we are trying to improve that. So that was my uh, presentation. Of course, I'll be uh, uh, ready to answer uh, your questions if you if you have some uh, in here. Thank you very much. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon from uh, India. Um, I'm, I'm Jolan from um, um, Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency, and now um, have a trip to India together with uh, sitting together with my colleague. Benjamin, um, I'm very, uh, very pleased to um, um, present you the district cooling for residential buildings and, and its applications. And actually, in this presentation, I will um, share our experience in China and India, and then what is the um, possible technical solutions and, and what is the barrier and challenges. So actually, um, my colleague Benjamin um, already introduced uh, uh, what 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 is uh, district um, energy looks like. Um, it's mainly referred to um, district heating and cooling um, 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 by a centralized plan, and then it, uh, and and then and then with a co-generated um, system um, uh, with multiple multi fuel energy. So so in this system, actually any energy source renewable no matter present or future, can be used in the district level. And, and here, a lot of um, um, energy source, they, they may be not cost effective to use in single buildings, but they make sense to use in a district level. And, and for here, actually, I, want, I would like to highlight the definition of district cooling again. Um, it, is, it, it is defined as a public service like electricity, like water and gas that a municipality should um, supply, supply or provide to the community. And, 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 and also here, actually, um, um, take an example, um, no one, what, no one uh, would like to build a power plant in their building because of they are using uh, because they are using electricity. So the same consideration here is like um, no, uh, it, it should be um, uh, it, it should be visible to to have this centralized cooling system to supply um, cooling to every building. Yeah. So, so what's include uh, in a cooling system? It's um, the um, all the district cooling system can be divided into three components. One is the the district cooling plan, uh, what we call supply supply source, and then another uh, uh, another component is distribution system, mainly um, mainly referred to networks, uh, which will transfer all the uh, heating or cooling to to uh, from the district cooling plan to all the buildings and then the third one is the end users and and it also referred to the substations with metering system and and as well as the internal air condition system inside the building 
So in the district cooling plan, actually, we normally we have um, cooling towers, we have chillers, we have um, 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 pumps, and also um, thermal storage tanks. And and what? What does a district cooling system change if you apply to a to a single building? Basically, um, in in the feature here, actually you can see that on the on the left, um, there's a standalone um, heating and cooling system in buildings. Normally, they will they will uh, they will build the the chillers in the in their basement, and then they have pipe pipe to distribute distribute the, all the coolings and then they have cooling towers on the rooftop. By connecting to the district cooling system, actually all the end users, they do not need the space for chillers, for cooling towers, for um, all the transformers to supply electricity um, to the cooling sources. So they can give a lot of free space on the rooftop. As you can see on the on the feature, they can change to garden and then as well as in the basement, they can change, they can be changed to parking lots. And so 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 specifically in the in the in the end user or in the building level, actually uh, let's let's have a closer look. What does it change? So normally for a standalone building say cooling system, they have chillers, they have cooling towers and circulated pumps, and then they have electric transformer for all these cooling sources. But if you connect it to district cooling system, all these components will be changed, will be replaced by a heat exchanger, which connect connect to um, district cooling and also the internal AC systems and also some control system and metering system. So, so on the left, that is all the components um, uh, on the end user side. And and for the interior system, actually, um, um, for for conventional uh, AC system in the in the building, they they will have um, chi water pump to circulate all the chi water, and then they have fan coil or air handling units as the 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 the, uh, the the equipment to deliver cooling to individual rooms or apartments. But 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 uh, but by um. Um, connecting to this cooling system. Actually, what you need to do is you need to calibrate the cheap water pumps, whether it's um, have the same um, uh, water flow, have the same head, that's, and uh, it, it can be changed or kept. And then, and then also, also there's a little bit um, um, calibrate, calibration with um, supply and return temperature um, provided by cheap water uh, by, by, by district cooling system to see that um, um, if the fan car or, or, or the end air handling units can work in, in, in the same um, condition. So for most of the cases, it, they are uh, all these uh, fan cars and air handling units can be kept as the same. So, so, so the last part would be the control system. So, as you can see, that the um, they, there's a, a heating exchanger in each building to connect um, um, from district cooling system and the interior AC system inside the building. So, for the uh, for the district cooling side, they they will guarantee the supply temperature. Uh, um, to the to the to the heat exchangers, and then they need to get um, signals from the, the 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 end user side to 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 see whether the return chi water temperature is is okay, so that they can maintain the the suitable delta T for high efficient um, operation. And and then for the end user side, for the building side, actually, um, what they want to do is to control the return temperature. Uh, um, of the chill water. So, so and, and, and meanwhile, they, um, there's some extra metering um, um, equipments will be installed so that the, the end users can pay for their bill by, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, by, by, by this metering uh, results. Um, so, so, so come back to the residential buildings uh, when they connect it to district cooling. Um, so what's the benefit? For uh, for district cooling system can bring 
uh, um, to the residents. Actually, um, when we when we say this um, application, we we focus on two types of um, buildings. The first type of buildings is like luxury apartments and communities, and these luxury buildings they they would focus on more high. Um, uh, they will focus. Uh, they, they they request higher comfort um, um, environments. So, so the district cooling, by connecting to district cooling, they can have higher quality of public service. So, so the, 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 the traditional definition of public service is extended to not only included um, electricity, water, but also including heating, cooling, domestic hot water, etc. And another thing is uh, I would like to talk about uh, in the next slide is like the um, district cooling system can enable um, for higher quality of indoor thermal environment. So they can provide cheap fresh air. They can um, they can they can provide higher air exchange ratio, and then they can prevent all the walls inside the 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 the, the, the apartment to become mold. So here is actually a, a comparison between district cooling and other cooling technology. And then as you can see that the normal cooling technology nowadays apply to cheap, uh, to residential buildings, in, including speed AC and VRV or VRF. So you can see that for in, indoor environment control. So both um, both cooling technology, they can control the temperature, but unfortunately, the AC and VRV, they cannot, um, they cannot humidify the, the, the indoor, in, indoor environment. They can have some ability to humidify, and, and they can control both of, all of the, the cooling um, technology. They can control the wind speed, but, but split AC and VRV or VRF, they cannot provide fresh air and they cannot treat the fresh air. That is why a lot of um, um, split uh, AC system actually, they cannot improve the, uh, uh, the VOC or the, the PM 2.5, you know, uh, um, condition. So roughly, they can, they can have their own filters, they can um, improve a little, but they cannot improve the roughly. So for the indoor air quality, that is what I talk about because the central, the central um, cooling system or, or conventional central system, they can, they have the ability to filter the fresh air. They can they, to treat the fresh air, so they can provide indoor um, with clean um, fresh air. And so, 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 so this is the potential technology solutions for luxury apartments that is applied in like. China, like in some of the residential building projects, um, th this is what we call temperature and humidity independent control system. So they 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 use um, high temperature uh, chill what uh, high temperature chill water to control the temperature for indoor. So basically, they use like um, twelve degrees C to sixteen degrees C of chill water to 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 control the 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 the. the uh, the, the sensible heat. So this kind of uh, um, equipment should be radiation um, panel or dry fan coil. And then for the fresh air, because you need to dehumidify or humidify it, so they need lower temperature of tree water. So normally it's like seven to 10 degrees C. And then this can be like a, a, a different kinds of ventilation equipments. Um, So, so, um, so, so this is about um, um, luxury apartments, and then uh, there's a lot of um, focus nowadays, like in India and China, that they focus on conventional apartments and communities because of the the heat wave um, um, last summer. So, so the basic idea for this conventional uh, uh, for for this cooling system is to provide cold air. Um, 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 to 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 um, to how to say to um, to solve the 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 heat stove to as uh, a heat stove um, to to help the public health. So 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 this kind of equipment they replace split AC directly and then with simple fan coil system without fresh air, and then. 
uh, and then the, the benefit, one of the benefit of this way is that uh, they, they provide, it can provide relative cheap way to, to, to solve this um, cooling problem in developing countries. And then, and then they also bring in the increased district energy efficiency. And this, this table shows you that um, 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 the, com uh, the comparison between different kinds of cooling technology and its primary energy efficiency and peak load shifting factor. So basically, when you, when you download any electricity from the grid, and then and then the primary energy efficiency is there. So 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 for split AC and VRV actually it is 25 to 30 percent. But if you use um, district cooling with tri generation or with um, thermal storage, you know combine them and then you can increase them um, easily to 50 percent to 75 percent. So it's almost double the efficiency. And, and and so also for split AC, actually you cannot shift the peak low of um, electricity, but for district cooling, because we can use like thermal storage, we can we can benefit from the diversity from different buildings for cooling demand. So so they can they have the ability to shift the peak low of electricity from thirty percent to sixty percent. So that is the benefit. So normal, norm, uh, so so normally we use um, um, this um, technology that is the normal fan core system um, to 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 solve this um, um, connection. So basically, we will install the fan core in bed, uh, bedrooms, uh, which can be turned on whenever needed, and then and then it's only uh, it it only provides cooling, uh, but it can help to uh, prevent heat stroke while the heat wave days. And so it's suitable for apartments for mid middle class people or social house. Um, so here is what some of the barriers and challenges we as we um, uh, um, um, we uh, develop projects in um, in India and China and other uh, developing countries. So I outlined, yeah, actually there's a lot, uh, there's quite some, but um, I just outline like three um, most important thing. One is the the the, the price. Um, for for most of the case, um, residents may not aware of how much they pay for cooling when they only pay for the bill of electricity. So they don't they don't actually understand the the different costs between the AC and district cooling, um, and and also the residential buildings have lower electricity tariff than commercial buildings. So that makes um, uh, the the district cooling price, um, which is normally uh, normally used in commercial buildings, will have higher price than residential buildings. And then the second one, I, I think, is also. Also very important is the lack of regulation to prevent, you know, installation of competing split AC systems in apartments. Um, because if if they have the chance to, you know, install the split AC while they already have um, committed to uh, connect to district cooling, and then they will they will they will have the chance to 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 do not to not use. Um, District cooling, which will be a waste in investment, uh, and and then also also the the third one is when when we integrate the 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 fan core system into these apartments, um, extra spaces in the house and maintenance work uh, is required. So normally fan core system requires minimum 30, 300 millimeter for cheap water pipes and fan core to install. And also the maintenance work for pipes and fan core is required. So, so um, one of our uh, uh, suggestion is that the, the municipality should publish some incentive policies to encourage district cooling in residential buildings uh, for the purpose of public health. So right now, actually, we consider district cooling as well uh, similar to district heating is like related to public health so we need to think about how to do it in a simple way and cost effective way to cover most of the society and here is all my presentation and thank you for your attention good afternoon to the webinar attendees firstly i would like to thank uh, c2e2 and unep for hosting this webinar
it's a wonderful initiative that uh, you all are working to uh, uh, just just recapping joe spoke about uh, the potential issues and red flags uh, and also potentially solutions for operational residential customers that are, are connected to dc system would be facing and how to tackle them and uh, chen highlighted impact on each building level uh, on each building level uh, system which is connected to dc versus having its own cooling uh, he also highlighted a very important point on uh, subsidies of power which uh, plays an important role in uh, the decision making for uh, for a developer to choose between a dc or a ac while he is uh, designing his system uh, while he is implementing his building um, in my presentation i would like to uh, highlight few of uh, few of the areas where uh, the decision making process is involved and uh, although we understand that district cooling is the most efficient form of cooling at present uh, however, the the decision is not only made on energy efficiency, and most of the times it's made on economic viability of of the whole system. Moving on, then jumping into my presentation, uh, just to give you a brief overview on on Tabdeed, we are a listed uh, uh, publicly listed company in in DFM with Mobadla and NG being our largest shareholders. Tabreed currently has 74 district cooling plants, uh, and we are operating and serving around 1.1 million ton, uh, refrigerated tons of cooling all across GCCA and have been operating for the last 20 years. As a part of our expansion plan, uh, we decided to grow our market geographically, and uh, Tabreed has uh, earlier this year uh, executed a concession agreement with uh, the AP government for providing cooling to the uh, Amravati government complex for their government buildings. Um, since this workshop uh, webinar is more focused towards residential, just giving a synopsis on the residential portfolio that Tabreed has. Our 12 Tabreed's 12% 12 of uh, our cooling is to serve residential developments. Uh, we serve around 50 residential towers across GCC. Uh, for almost around 130,000 uh, tons. One of uh, the world's biggest district cooling plant, uh, which is in Qatar, for 130,000 tons, serves around 60,000 tons of residential developments. Now, uh, what we thought about uh, important is to highlight the key learnings that we have, uh, we have gone through and uh, we have experienced while serving residential customers, uh, residential customers. The, the biggest issue uh, that we faced, the first one, is on the overestimation of cooling demand. Now, this is a common pain point across the entire cooling industry. And uh, the potential way we try to mitigate this is to go, uh, go on a modular district cooling plant to reduce or to minimize our pre-investments that we can do, go modular, so that uh, the risk of overestimation uh, can be mitigated to some extent. The second, mo second most important factor is the perception of uh, district cooling being very expensive. Uh, this is mainly due to the monthly bills that the end user have to pay for, in which they have to pay for uh, a component of capital recovery. Uh, where, wherein in a split AC or alternative systems, they install it once and then for next seven, eight years, they don't have to worry and they only have to pay for the electricity cost uh, beyond that. What is important to, uh, to mitigate this is to educate the stakeholders on the life cycle cost analysis and not looking independently on purely for the monthly cost of electricity uh, itself. Uh, and the third factor, to some extent, is related uh, to the second one, is uh, the fact that a residential user has to pay a fixed fee irrespective of, uh, irrespective of uh, whether he's using cooling or not, whether it's summer or winter, uh, he's expected to pay a fixed fee. 
this is a this is an issue which uh, which is derived from the fact of how district cooling models have been evolved over the period uh, which were primarily focused for commercial developments and they they have been adopted as is for uh, residential systems um, however we see uh, we see that the way the more adoption on district cooling can happen for residential development is if we try thinking out of the box and try having solutions in which uh, we address these pain points of the end user and uh, and try to mitigate these solutions and one of the way to mitigate this is is to uh, mimic the kind of cash flows the end user would have so have have a unit owner or a developer pay for capital infrastructure cost for district cooling so that the that the end user only ends up paying for uh, for the variable cost or the onm cost on a monthly basis or uh, all the more better i mean you'll see in a case study we have presented later that uh, if if we factor in diversity and provide that benefit to a residential development this is a win win situation for uh, for the entire system moving forward uh, again uh, the, although the focus is on district cooling but uh, commercially we, we we should be understanding uh, what are the factors that determine the economic success of a of a system I mean, the, one of them being the system efficiency uh, here i'm just listing out what we what we see as system efficiencies on different uh, different types of technologies that are there for space cooling uh, window window acs and split ac would would be the most inefficient ones uh, which would on average have an efficiency of 1.6 to 2 kilowatt per tons vrv systems actually in in recent past have catched up very well and improved uh, significantly uh, they they tend to have an efficiency of anywhere between 1.1 and 1.5 uh, kilowatt per tons. Uh, standalone chill uh, standalone chilled water chillers um, is also a sol uh, solution that a developer can use. I mean, if if he has a big development, he need not connect to a district cooling plant and have his own uh, water cool chillers it's the same technology however it's uh, it does not benefit from the factor of diversity and uh, also i mean since we don't expect each developer to have expertise on operating maintaining these systems we generally see uh, the efficiency of these systems not optimal uh, uh, they would be anywhere between 0.9 to 1.1 and uh, obviously the most efficient systems are uh, centrally district cooling systems where we expect uh, efficiencies between 0.8 to 1 uh, in in recent period we we have also seen uh, various various technologies that have been improvised on where the 0.8 is also being challenged on and uh, Potentially, uh, we should be seeing systems designed and uh, operating as low as 0 0.65 to 0 0.7 in in context to to UAE or an Indian market uh, with the ambient temperatures in these in these regions. Moving on uh, to the case study, uh, the best way I thought to to demonstrate. Uh, what are the uh, what is the thought process a developer goes through and uh, and the pain points that we have, we as district cooling providers have to address uh, is not, uh, I mean, it is all good to show that uh, the district cooling system is more efficient and uh, more, uh, uh, it, it is much more uh, reliable, uh, environmental friendly. Uh, however, we have a couple of problems that uh, that we need to tackle and one of them as Chen highlighted was on the subsidy on the residential tariffs and and secondly the fact that uh, end of the day it uh, the, the developer would only implement this if he would be able to market and sell uh, sell his units um, keeping keeping that in mind uh, for a for a recent study we did for one of uh, one of the developer in india and I've just put it down as a case study and I'm taking you through that. Uh, this development, uh, residential development, 
which would have around 2 million square feet of sellable areas over eight eight towers uh, was planned um, in in the vicinity of uh, another big commercial district which is also expected to come in the next three to four years uh, the cooling demand on split ac was estimated to be uh, 8500 tons by the consultants uh, due to internal diversities uh, the the cooling load required to to be provided to by a dc system was uh, anticipated to be around 5000 tons uh, by planning dc the master developer could actually reduce the the power infrastructure requirement for the whole residential develop, development by around 10 megawatts which was the biggest incentive for uh, for the developer uh, in in order to to evaluate uh, the cost burden for end user we we took up a two layered approach first was to identify uh, the most economical solution uh, on a life cycle life cycle cost basis and secondly was to evaluate uh, the evaluate the cooling cost that the end user would be expected to pay on a on a monthly basis uh, the technologies we evaluated uh, were split ACs, rooftops, stand, uh, centralized district, uh, sorry, standalone centralized district cooling plants, and uh, and the fourth option was the one that connects connects to the existing district cooling system, uh, which was approximately two kilometers away. Uh, to to highlight the outcome, the split AC was found to be the most expensive, obviously because of the inefficiency of the system itself uh, standalone dc systems were, were more efficient uh, however they were, they had a higher capital cost compared to prv systems on a life cycle cost uh, basis dc system were found to be 10 percent more efficient or economical rather and vrv system were found to be 15 percent more economical compared to com compared to split acs However, the most uh, efficient form of cooling in this residential development uh, was found through connecting the resident, uh, this residential development to the mixed-use uh, DC system, which was around two kilometers away. Uh, this was mainly due to the high diversity benefit uh, that we could achieve of around 65%. And due to the diversity benefit, the, the capital cost uh, actually reduced uh, substantially, which uh, at the end of the day provided a 35% saving compared to, uh, compared to a split system. Uh, moving on, uh, the key considerations, and ju just to summarize the key consideration that, uh, that we found uh, to be suitable for uh, uh, choosing between an air cooled and uh, or a VRV system versus a district cooling system. And the, the thing that I would like to highlight here is uh, this is economically this is a trade off between uh, a district cooling system and a decentralized system where uh, a DC system would uh, would require pre investments on network versus uh, having higher efficiencies or better efficiencies. So Firstly, uh, if uh, if you have a mixed-use development, you would obviously benefit having a district cooling system where you could uh, you could optimize on the installed capacity, reduce the capital costs, improve the efficiencies better. Um, however, if uh, the development has a long phasing plan or the expectation is to have a long uh, occupancy ramp up. Uh, it, it might be better off to have VRV or air cool systems installed uh, because they avoid the investments, uh, pre investments. Uh, obviously, high density uh, systems would, uh, high density developments would favor district cooling systems. Uh, again, power infrastructure wise, it would be better. To have a district cooling system as we have seen before because they would end up uh, requiring a lower power infrastructure uh, a dc system would have higher efficiency which would mean they they have lower emissions and would promote the status of the development to a green building 
uh, we anticipate onm cost uh, would be lower for the dc system due to due to it being a centralized and not uh, 10 buildings having their 10 different onm teams uh, and lastly i mean dc dc system uh, provides better building design flexibility and aesthetics uh, as the as the system the district cooling system itself is on an independent plot of land uh, moving on to to the summary uh, so in a, in our evaluation what, what we found uh, was to to create benchmarks and to create rather stereotypes uh, we, we we found that uh, small uh, standalone one off small residential developments or a villa community as such would would make sense to have uh, independent split acs or uh, systems at their own levels uh, a large one off large residential development the point b uh, would would benefit from having uh, a building level central uh, vrv system however mega residential developments uh, where you would have high density probably more than 6 to 10 buildings uh, requiring maybe around uh, 3 to 3 to 5 or 6000 tons uh, either vrv system or central centralized system uh, centralized dc system would work but uh, the the place where district cooling system fits perfectly well is in a mixed use development where you have 30 to 40 percent of the development comprising of residential and the remaining comprising of commercials, malls, hotels, uh, complete mixed use. And the benefit of diversity actually kicks, kicks in uh, drastically out here. The other, the second part of the evaluation that, uh, that I just briefly talked upon was uh, the end user cost that, uh, is, uh, that he expects to pay for uh, for a monthly bill uh, the, uh, as i also mentioned earlier this this is a factor of uh, factor of having an appropriate business model in place and at the same time being being uh, or thinking a bit out of the box and seeing how how this can be managed uh, so for for a for a system for a centralized system uh, we we found that if the cost of uh, power infrastructure is recovered from the from the end user the total cost uh, of recovery that the end user will have to pay or the unit owner will have to pay increases by 4 to 7 percent however comparing this to having him install uh, split ac himself the the capital cost of centralized system is around 15 to 25 percent lower so although the the cost uh, for the development increases but uh, when you compare the cost of development and add on top the cost of split acs uh, you would show a capital cost saving to the end user uh, on uh, now factoring this on uh, considering that the capital costs have either been paid for or have been absorbed due to diversity benefits uh, and there is no capital recovery or very marginal capital recovery that still needs to be uh, done from the end user uh, the the what what we found was that the vrv systems are uh, generally 8 to 12 percent more uh, have a bill which are 8 to 12 percent lower than what a split ac would have and a centralized dc system would actually have 25 to 30 percent uh, lower lower bills uh, variable bills uh, than than a split ac and here i'm purely comparing onm cost versus the cost of electricity an end user would pay on the split acs um, i i I hope I have uh, given some insights on uh, on how we can plan plan having a, a wider adoption on on appropriate cooling solutions for residential developments better. And uh, I'll be available for any Q and A's that that might come up uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to present my uh, topic on 
perspectives of efficient cooling in social housing in india i am roshmi sen working as an assistant professor at nit raurkela uh, with a background in architecture and city planning so i would like to give you some insight on the from a city planners or a neighborhood planners perspective how social housing would be needing a district cooling infrastructure how we can make it feasible because uh, apparently speaking the uh, uh, cooling demand in social housing is much lower compared to the commercial sector and the high income uh, uh, residences uh, but uh, there is a lot of need for uh, advocating a centralized cooling system uh, here in the decades to come so coming to the background if we see the figure uh, uh, energy scenario of india in international context it is uh, much less compared to major economies but this figure also takes into account very many non electrified households of india in villages and this is uh, not the situation in case of urban india where we are facing a very high amount of uh, urbanization uh, with with lot of mass housing construction and uh, as you can see that india is currently dependent on fossil fuel imports which uh, is uh, constituting around 70% of uh, the energy consumption which pushes india to lot of uh, international energy market volatility so if we think uh, with if we think about the cooling load or uh, in the residential mar uh, housing sector the, uh, and uh, advocating district cooling there will be a huge opportunity for uh, pushing renewable energy sources uh, in uh, uh, meeting the cooling uh, energy demand here uh, now coming quickly to the background of affordable housing sector in india we find from the given figures that almost nine though the per capita energy consumption or per household energy consumption is much less but the affordable housing sector that is low and middle income group constitutes about 95% of the entire housing market uh, and high incomes consider uh, uh, comprise only 5% so uh, this is a background on cooling need in the developing world and we from a research like uh, from my personal survey uh, my uh, as i uh, reviewed the literature the percentage growth of air cooler that is the unitized acs in india is very high and it's going up exponentially from the national data from national sur sample survey organization of india and if you see uh, that uh, paper published in energy policy that among top 20 uh, uh, countries hot 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 uh, cities in the world there are seven uh, cities of india that is madras ahmedabad mumbai hyderabad calcutta uh, delhi and bangalore which fall uh, in the uh, like the, uh, is responsible for very high cooling degree days in india and uh, where cooling need in housing is going to be very high in the in, in future decades to come so this is regarding some surveys i had household primary surveys i had done in social housing sector in the city of calcutta or kolkata which is also called kolkata uh, uh, which is which relates to my ongoing research where i had surveyed around uh, 8 housing complexes and uh, 400 samples were taken from the low income housing and for, uh, around 400 from the middle income housing to find the cooling demand in these housing complexes so the uh, housing complexes were of uh, were mass housing uh, and as we could see there were four or five storied housing for the low income housing groups and for the middle income housing they were even some some of the complexes were high rise so this is basically the housing typology uh, in mass housing complexes in uh, social housing sector in india so some of these housing complexes also had high income housing but the in high income housing high energy consumption is already implied and i was more interested to study the social income sector social housing sector so i considered low and middle income housing groups so from my uh, results i found that uh, in the low income housing 
uh, AC penetration was around 10%. This is this is very low income housing, but still they were having money to buy air conditioning. And for the middle income housing, it was around 50%. So as we could see in the various housing pockets, the variation of this cooling demand was high. That is, it for middle income housing, it ranged from as low as 33% to uh, 77%. And for low income housing, some, some of the complexes, it was 5% of the households which were having air conditioners. And there, there are some households where, um, complexes where 37, as high as 37% low income housing uh, housing were having uh, acs so uh, and the percentage increase in uh, electricity bill for middle income housing varied between 35% to 120% that is more than double of uh, air conditioning usage uh, uh, the more than double of uh, the electricity consumption in non air conditioned households and it all uh, the increase for lig housing was 33 to 95% more for ac households as compared to non ac households so the total average increase we would see the difference in electricity bills between ac and non ac households is 80% uh, excess and uh, as you can see that there is really a uh, implied uh, lot of uh, penetration of ac in future because it's only 10 percent of households currently using non-ac and as uh, a developing nation the lifestyles and the cooling needs and uh, the comfort needs uh, for for the uh, households uh, are increasing even in the middle and low income groups. So obviously, uh, and one of the biggest reasons that, uh, like this is not the true picture because they, they, these households are all using split or uh, unitized units which are very having very high uh, operating cost so this cooling need is a suppressed cooling need because of very high operative cost of uh, the split units and this cooling need is going to increase because comfort expectations are increasing now coming to the existing scenario as i already talked about uh, all housing units are having easily available consumer market driven split air conditioners which are having very high operating costs and low efficiency where the cop ranges cop is the coefficient of performance of the air conditioner uh, higher the cop uh, more efficient the system is uh, here uh, in split unit the cop is around 2.7 to 2.9 or maybe up to 3.1 and uh, there's an another interesting inefficient thing happening that the rejected heat from the uh, ac condensers go up and they actually uh, go like it's it's like it's 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 like a stack effect that the uh, hot air from coming out of the condenser go around in the go up and they also affect the, um, the, the when they touch the um, these uh, condensers or of the split units in the upper foot there is a stack effect and reduction of AC, AC, air conditioning efficiency due to um, um, as the uh, as the condenser becomes even hotter so uh, if we uh, move to a community scale school cooling scenario uh, the cop uh, the, you, you will, the, the, the uh, we, we can achieve much um, higher cop and it can be a really more efficient system uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, so uh, so coming to uh, it it's the 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 district cooling system has already been explained by previous uh, speakers so i'm not going into the detail uh, now coming to the key benefits of uh, cooling uh, district cooling you have this energy efficiency benefits where the higher cop and hence uh, you have a lower cooling energy consumption. You can have a clean energy emission re reduction plan, as I said, that if it goes to the, uh, if the cooling becomes a centralized phenomenon, then that, uh, the cooling load, which is almost 50% of the energy consumption of the entire household can be centralized. Then you can have options for photovoltaics or other uh, renewable sources, which can actually generate that amount of energy. And then you have uh, financial benefits of lower operating costs. And then you, you can, uh, then, then, then there are other things like uh, there are 
uh, centralized schooling can provide that it's 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 actually uh, driving the um, uh, the operating cost away from the consumer and it's actually uh, giving you uh, giving it a aesthetic look because the building is not uh, in, in individual uh, units are uh, un unitized acs are not show showing up and then coming to uh, the so the institutional mechanisms uh, for implementing district cooling uh, can be the private developer or any energy servicing company a governmental support and or international actors uh, as i just uh, roughly calculated the com cost comparison between the two star five star and district cooling system my figures showed that a one ton dsc would be around 60000 60, to 70000 inr without thermal storage and around 1 lakh inr which is uh, 100000 inr with thermal storage against 50000 inr for five star rated and 30000 inr for a two star rated uh, 1.5 ton ac which shows that the initial operating cost for district cooling is huge but uh, initial in, initial investment cost for district cooling is much greater than the unitized system so uh, they are so readily available in the market so uh, we proposed a pri private developer as a project financer for mass housing it can be in a ppp model uh, it can have a build own operate model where the mark uh, where uh, district cooling has uh, uh, go is going to uh, comprise 4 to 8 percent of the construction cost uh, 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 other enabling actors for advocating district cooling can be a isco or a uh, energy servicing company which offers energy services and after identifying energy saving opportunities so as we can see uh, in india there are already 141 iscos operating in uh, 2017 and they can be involved in the process uh, of mobilizing district cooling infrastructure in housing projects uh, then you have the governmental support where they you can have subsidies and uh, international actors our united nations already plays a big role uh, then coming to my summary of conclusions as we see there is a very um, high um, uh, rate of increase in unitized ACs uh, and uh, as you see already 50 percent of middle income houses are using unitized ACs uh, and then uh, uh, district cooling uh, can decrease the summer monthly AC electricity consumption by 60 to 65 percent and it can be easily integrated with renewable sources it has a very small amount of fraction of construction cost of the, of an entire housing uh, and it can be uh, taken up as a responsibility by the private develop, developer to um, be uh, to develop the in infrastructure but uh, yes uh, uh, there are high upfront investment costs so coming to my future work i am actually looking into the density scale in which a district cooling is going to work in residential complexes um, and i would like to uh, uh, thank uh, professor forrest meggers my mentor and collaborator at princeton university for introducing me to this uh, very relevant low exergy community cooling research area which i am going to work with in future thank you Yes, my name is Vikram Murthy. I'm president of ISHRAE, the Indian Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers. I'm very pleased to be on this seminar and listen to all the panelists before me. And I must admit, I have learned a lot after listening to all of them. Our Society of Air Conditioning Engineers, ISHRAE, is a very large engineering society. We have over 26,000 members across India, over half of whom are professional members in 41 chapters and the remainder are students in over 150 student branches across India. So our focus is on research, on technical work, on standards, on fellowship of our members and promoting the arts and sciences of building engineering services across India, including refrigeration. So here I am to present to you. So I wish to uh, highlight two key features of a district cooling system. Cooling by circulating cold fluid through heat exchangers, as you've heard, and also the concept of thermal storage. I'm going to walk you through uh, district cooling systems in India from a historical perspective, coming up to more recently, 
and towards the end i will tell you about some actual district cooling system projects which have been done in hyderabad so the concept of district cooling in india dates back four centuries it's not a new one and uh, palaces and monuments were cooled doing the same concepts of uh, thermal energy storage as well as heat exchange so here you see on the left side of your screen a picture of a palace i'm sorry this is the deeg palace in bharatpur in rajasthan which has very hot and dry summers as high as 43 degrees centigrade but a low wet bulb temperature of just 22 and a half degrees centigrade so you can see uh, on the right side of your screen that the district cooling system is cooled the condensers are cooled by a spray pond which acts as the condenser and the spray from this uh, from the spray pond acts as an evaporative cooling system along the library so you can see these are two examples of district cooling systems in india which have been dated back very long ago as long back 30 years ago in 1991 there's a building in juhu which was a residential building it had centrally air conditioned apartments with two chillers in the basement i used to visit this apartment because i had a friend who lived over there and he was the proud owner of a flat with central air conditioning with air handling units and ducts in his apartment long before even split air conditioners came to india this is the place where i stay this is a very large residential complex in bombay there are 4800 apartments with many 20 storied buildings as you can see over here and apart from this there is a school outside uh, there is a clubhouse there is a supermarket there is a health center and a business center if you count all the individual air conditioners and the uh, packaged air conditioners working here the load would be around 20000 tons but if the developer could have put a district cooling system it would have been as little as one third of that so this is the big uh, this is the big challenge we have now i'm going to tell you about the residential district cooling projects in hyderabad so this is a, a developer called my home group uh, the, this is a building i'm going to refer to the first one it's called my home abra it has 380 apartments and a clubhouse and the mechanical engineering plumbing system including a district cooling was designed by synergy infra consultants in hyderabad this is a picture of the building you can see it is about a million square feet uh, with a calculated ac load of 5000 tons you can see the building looks very pretty without all the split air conditioner outdoor units either on the side or vrf units outdoor units on the terrace this is a layout of the building as you can see and this is a typical picture inside uh, one of the Uh, living rooms and you can see the cassette unit i'm sorry the cassette unit mounted in the ceiling there are mixture of high wall units cassette units and concealed fan coil units in this apartments and none of them have ducts so you have cooling without ducting which is very elegant and with the benefit of chill water cooling so here the summary the air conditioning load is i told you around close to 5000 tons for the tower a and b and for the clubhouse with a million square feet if everybody put in an air conditioner he would have to put in 4778 tons of air conditioning if he went for a vrf with some diversity because vrfs offer diversity for each flat or each group of flats then we would have had 3300 tons and uh, what is actually been put over here is a chill water plant with a diversity of 30% as high as that because each residence normally doesn't use more than a ton at a time and so a 1400 ton plant is quite sufficient for this large capacity housing uh, system so here we are going to analyze the three of the, the types of air conditioning if you had split air conditioner the cost would have been just us dollars 2 per square foot uh, the park consumption would be in the region of as bakulesh told you 1 and 1/2 kilowatts per ton and if you went for uh, vrf system the cost would be higher 3 and 1/2 dollars per square feet but the maintenance charges would be as high as us dollar 300 per apartment annually power consumption would come down a bit to 1.2 kilowatts per ton but the beauty of doing district cooling system is that the system costs around 3 dollars per square foot because the capacity of the system is not as high as in split air conditioners or in vrf air conditioners the maintenance charges are reasonably low the power consumption is down to 1 kilowatt per ton and it could be probably even lower and it's safe because we only handle chill water it is installed by the developer this is the downside the developer has to uh, put in the plant it requires space in the basement for chillers 
It needs separate thermal metering, which is done for each flat, and it requires space for the cooling towers. So this is a summary of this building. Uh, it has two sets of towers with 380 apartments. It has two 450 ton water chillers. It has 250 ton brine chillers, and it has 300 ton hour refrigeration of thermal storage tank. It has been running for the past three years. Uh, the lead consultant of uh, Synergy Infra lives in this building, and we have the opportunity at Ishray to do some uh, metering, and we are going to come out with the actual performance of thermal performance as well as the energy performance, and we will have all those data available for public uh, scrutiny to make you understand how residential cooling project is working in India successfully. So if I have to summarize, there are chillers which have uh, twin circuits and they can operate at part load, a very low GWP refrigerant and entering in chill water is at 13 and eight. And in this charging mode, the brine chiller works at minus five and a half degrees uh, for glycol and the uh, energy comes down to 70% because of charging. And here is a picture, a typical picture of the storage tanks. They have, uh, they work with ethylene glycol and they have eutectic nodules, nodules which are inside, which change their state, and able to store energy. And the number of nodules inside these tanks determines the heat exchange rate, as well as the energy which you can store. So here are some pictures of the actual installation. On the right side is the picture, uh, left side is the picture of the chillers. Here are the condenser water pumps. Here are the large thermal storage tanks, as you can see, well contained and fenced up. Here are the chill water pumps on this side. And here's a picture of the chill water piping running in the basement and it will rise in shafts and enter each flat. And there's also a, a heat exchanger for exchanging heat for the uh, separate towers for each tower. And here's another upcoming residential project. Another developer, Jayabiri developers are doing a building called the Peak. You can see it is getting ready. And here's a picture of what it will look like when it's done. It has 145 apartments, 30 floors, 600,000 square feet, 400 ton chillers, a 250-ton brine chiller, and 750 ton hours of refrigeration of thermal storage. It's another one. And here's the third one. Jayberry developers are doing temple tree with 70 luxury villas. Again, half a million square feet and brine chiller as well as regular chillers and 750 THRs of thermal storage. This is work is in progress and this is an actual picture maybe in uh, six months from now, it'll all be up in commission. And this is a uh, project which has just begun and uh, reasonably uh, developed, but they are also going in for a district cooling system. These are the same developers as the My Home Abra, which was commissioned three years ago, and Synergy Infra also the consultants for all these projects. This is work in progress. So I have told you about four projects in Hyderabad, all of which are residential district cooling done by the developer, Included in the price, the customer buys an air-conditioned flat. He's metered centrally. He has a low uh, outgoing for maintenance. So it's a success story if it's done privately. This is an example of district cooling performing. Uh, we have to talk about some of the challenges and the barriers. So I would say the investment and return for a developer are something which he has to consider. But once he realizes the cost is proportional to the tonnage and the cost can be distributed in the sale, because it's a very small cost compared to the cost of the apartment, it will be a viable situation. What about the desire for owners to have control over private space versus shared cooling utility? So there's an outdated concept. Customers now will slowly understand. We are sharing automobiles. Why can't we share cooling? Also, the other challenge is the low awareness by consultants and architects. I put an exclamation mark because this is a task for Ishre and people like the UNEP to educate people about the benefits of district cooling, about its costs, about its ability to do uh, social justice also when we go in for cooling systems which are able to perform with uh, good thermal comfort even for social development. Also regulatory framework by municipality is absent. I would think that we as a society would work towards education of municipalities to say that large development residential projects should only have district cooling and there should be no individual air conditioners in such properties. This is a long-term plan for us, but I'm sure we are going to get there. The, the last thing I would talk about is that land for district cooling systems in Metro is expensive, but is it really? If you, go to, if you look at the place where I live, we have about 25 or 30 acres of land. That's because the development was done by dismantling a very large factory 
and the space is well used. There's also a community space for the neighboring people to come and play. So I think it's all a matter of how you plan your development and developers today, especially in cities like Hyderabad and Bangalore, are moving far ahead in district cooling systems and it's only here to stay and grow steadily. So I would say, concluding, residential apartment cooling by district cooling systems can offer really good thermal comfort with low energy bills and low GWP. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for patiently listening to me. I am open to answer any questions. Yes, thank you uh, very much, Aris. Uh, so I think we'll keep the Q&A session very short because we're obviously at the time as well. And as Aris said, we'll share all of the presentations um, and also share the questions uh, by email at the end. Uh, so one question that came through um, for Huao is for the individual contracting, um, how do you choose the buildings that are going to connect to the district cooling system in the future? And does the individual contracting of, of households, that additional cost, how do, you, um, how do you balance that? Is it with higher tariffs or is there a cross subsidy from the commercial buildings? Okay, let, let me try to answer the, to, to both questions. So um, regarding the first one, I would say that uh, uh, it's not, in fact, in Lisbon, it's not us that, that choose the, the, um, the residential buildings that are connected. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the other way around it. I, I would say it's the, it's the buildings or the promoters of the buildings that uh, choose uh, if they want to be connected or not. And uh, because we have a, a, a well, uh, we can say a concession area where we are supposed to connect all the buildings that are interested in being connected. So um, I would say normally, uh, um, except in the fact if, if, if they are very uh, far from the network, we will connect all of them. Um, in fact, as I explained in my presentation, there are additional costs in having uh, individual contracting and metering uh, for residential markets because you have to set up a, a, a dedicated a small organization. How do we treat that? In fact, uh, in our case in Lisbon, we have a, a, a flat uh, energy for all the customers, but uh, in case a, a building has individual metering and contracting, there is a small extra fee, a small additional fee, uh, which is charged to uh, customers which have individual metering. Uh, well, I can tell you that it's about five euros per month, uh, which is an extra fee paid only in case uh, uh, the, uh, the customer has individual contracting and, mit and metering. All the rest is the same for all the customers. I'll just ask one last question, then I think we should probably end because we're over time. And that was a question that came for Bakulesh is how with, uh, how with residential connection, how does that relate to the concession model? Do you get a concession that includes the residential buildings and does is there any risk sharing with the city if there's a concession and it includes residential buildings uh, no i mean what what we have experienced so far is uh, the fact that uh, the market actually for the, for the commercial district is getting up very well for adopting district cooling however i mean what what we're trying to see and trying to educate people is specifically where there is a mixed use development uh, residential should should be aiming to go for uh, residential de development should be aiming to go for uh, a district cooling system which could connect to I mean, either a centralized cooling plant or I mean, even what vikram highlighted uh, all throughout his presentation Probably it's it's a shift of thought, thought process that uh, we need to include. Um, obviously, the, the the business model will have to change. Uh, we'll have to see how uh, the cost burden is allocated and what kind of uh, uh, tariff structure is incorporated. But uh, given the fact that uh, if if these things are taken care of with a little help of uh, of either the municipality or uh, maybe the power, power uh, the power players uh, on subsidies for residential rent, whatever whatever that can be done, uh, the, the there is no risk as such for having residential developments connect uh, on.
on to a concession model so bakulesh i just have to say one thing uh, about power in india it is controlled by the energy regulation development authority which is the central government body so no local body can start changing tariffs except on an experimental basis so so that's the scenario in india that's that's correct uh, we we do yeah. understand that uh, yeah but it might change yeah. it it might change and uh, i mean what we have seen through is uh, in places where you want uh, district cooling to be planned for residential as of now is is been looked for high end luxury residential developments uh, it's still not been thought for the the low income groups or mid uh, mid income groups correct uh, however in in these places uh, the the consumption pattern of a, of each household uh, would be on the higher side which uh, in in which the tariff slab that applies to most of these developer or uh, uh, residential units rather would Correct. be similar to uh, similar to a commercial tariff that applies so it's it's yeah. not, it, it's, right. it's a perception issue i would rather call that's right that's right thank you very much uh, for your responses uh, unfortunately uh, we're over time uh, we expect it to last 90 minutes and it's way over time that we anticipate for the webinar uh, we'll try to do our best to respond to your questions uh, through our knowledge management system we will share all the information uh, in a few days uh, with all the people who attended the webinar so uh, I would like to say thanks to the panelists for the informative and interesting presentations and the audience for their active participation. Uh, the presentations will be beneficial for all stakeholders involved in energy efficiency and especially district cooling. Thank you for your attention and uh, wish you a good day or night from Copenhagen. <laughs>